Yes, Ms Orr. Commissioner, we are continuing with our ANZ case study for the purposes of the inappropriate advice topic. The next witness is Ms Kylie Rickson. Ms Rickson. No. Would you come into the witness box, please, Ms Rickson? Now, Ms Rickson, would you prefer to take an oath or would you prefer to make an affirmation? An affirmation, please. Affirm the witness, please. I solemnly and sincerely. I solemnly and sincerely. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you, Ms Rickson. Do sit down. Ms Williams. Thank you, Commissioner. Would you state your full name, please? Kylie Elizabeth Rickson. And are you the Chief Risk Officer for Digital and Wealth Australia at Australia and New Zealand Banking Group Limited? Yes, I am. Is your business address 242 Pitt Street, Sydney? Yes, it is. Uh, Ms Rickson, have you uh, prepared uh, two witness statements in answer to questions asked by the Royal Commission? Yes, I have. And have you received a summons to appear to give evidence and produce signed witness statements today? Yes, I have. Do you have the summons with you, Ms Rickson? Yes, I do. I tender the summons, Commissioner. Exhibit 2.150 will be summons to Ms Rickson. Uh, Ms Rickson, is your first witness statement dated 9 April 2018? Yes, it is. And do you have that statement with you? Yes, I do. Uh, is there a correction you wish to make on page 43 of the statement? Yes. Uh, does the correction relate to the row of the table which in the left hand column reads 2013? Yes it does. And is the correction that the date in the right hand column of that row should also read 2013 and not 2012? Yes that's right. Thank you Ms Rickson. Do you mind making the amendment and just initialling it for us Ms Rickson? Commissioner, I've mentioned to my learned friend a, a matter that I wish to address in chief with Ms Rickson uh, briefly uh, in relation to paragraphs 128 to 100. Sorry, which paragraph? Paragraphs 128 to 133 of the statement, Commissioner. Uh, Ms Rickson, could you turn to paragraph 128 at page 63 of the statement, please? Yes. Uh, were paragraphs 128 to 133 uh, correct at the time that you signed the statement? Yes, they were. Has there been a further development that has occurred in relation to the balanced scorecards since you signed the statement? Yes, there has. Uh, could you explain to the Commission, please, the key aspects of that further development? The uh, balanced scorecard for the ANZ financial planning business financial planner role uh, has been um, amended. The key amendments are the removal of uh, a, the two revenue measures that make up 15% of the scorecard and a redistribution of, um, of those percentages to other parts of the scorecard and the increase in the uh, prime access service delivery completion from 95% to 100%. Thank you, Ms Rickson. I'm going to ask that you be shown a document on the screen. Uh, Commissioner, this document has been uh, emailed to uh, the solicitors assisting the Commission. I'm told it can be displayed on the screen, although there is no number attached to it as yet. Uh, uh, Ms Rickson, do you recognise that document? Yes, I do. Uh, could you... Uh, d does that document... Uh, uh, ..describe the... Uh, key aspects of the changes to which you just referred? Yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, and can I direct your attention in particular to uh, page four of the document? Uh, 
does that page in particular <coughs> summarise uh, the key matters to which you just referred? Uh, I, I believe it's the next page, actually. I'm sorry. If we could go to page five, please. <coughs> yes, it does. Thank you, Ms Rickson. Commissioner, I tender that document. Exhibit 2.1. 151 will be updates to 2018 performance assist, uh, assessment framework ANZ financial planning. Oh, no, is the only not. date on it April 2018? Ms Rickson, is there a more precise date or is it just April 2018? I'm sorry, the young lady there was talking oh. to me and I, <laughs> I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, can we give a more precise date then, uh, just the month of April 2018? For, for the document? Uh, well, I believe that the scorecard um, was approved on the 12th of April. I ascertained that this morning. Thank you. Uh, exhibit 2.151 will be updates to 2018 performance ass assessment framework, ANZ financial planning, April 2018. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, now, Ms Rickson, subject to those further developments you've described and to the correction you made at page 43, and to the matters referred to in your supplementary statement, to which I'll come in a moment, are the contents of your statement dated the 9th of April 2018 true and correct? Yes, they are. I tender that statement, Commissioner, together with the exhibits. Uh, witness statement and exhibits of Ms Rickson of 9 April 2018 is two, exhibit 2.152. Uh, Ms Rickson, you have made a supplementary statement dated the 18th of April 2018, is that correct? Yes, I have. And are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes, they are. Uh, Commissioner, that statement is also produced and I tender that supplementary statement. Exhibit 2.153 will be supplementary statement of Ms Rickson dated 18 April 2018. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah. Ms Orr. <coughs> Ms Rickson, You've been put forward by ANZ to give evidence about ANZ's financial advice business? Uh, yes, in relate, relation to the witness statements that um, have just been described. Yes. Uh, you tell us in your witness statement that you're the Chief Risk Officer for Digital and Wealth Australia at ANZ. Yes, that's correct. What is Digital and Wealth Australia? Uh, wealth Australia, they're two separate divisions, so Wealth Australia is the division that includes the advice businesses that are the subject of my witness statement and, uh, and other businesses. And the digital business is a separate division of ANZ. And for how long have you been the Chief Risk Officer for Wealth Australia? Since April 2014. And what are your main responsibilities in that role? Uh, I am the um, head or the executive of the risk function for the wealth division. So my uh, main responsibilities are to um, oversight the uh, risk um, framework and control environment for the wealth division. We heard from Mr Werrett on Friday that ANZ operates its financial advice business through four entities, ANZ Financial Planning, RI Advice Group, Millennium 3 Financial Services and Financial Services Partners. In your role as Chief Risk Officer, are you responsible for risk across all of those entities? Uh, yes, I'm responsible for the oversight of the risk and control environment across each of those entities? Yes, that's correct. Now, you, you heard the evidence of Mr Wearout on Friday, I assume? Uh, no, I did not. Have you uh, read the transcript of Mr Wearout's evidence on Friday? No, I have not. Right. You're not aware what evidence he gave on Friday? Uh, no. Okay. Um, uh, Mr Wearout told us on Friday about the relationship between the uh, aligned dealer groups RI Advice Group, Millennium 3 and Financial Services Partners and their authorised representatives. That's something you're familiar with as well? Yes, I am. Um, now, ANZ also operates its financial advice business through ANZ Financial Planning. Yes, that's correct. And what are the main differences between ANZ Financial Planning and the aligned dealer groups? 
Uh, ANZ Financial Planning is a what's known as a salaried financial planning business. So the advisors in that business are employees of uh, ANZ. The aligned dealer groups um, operate under an authorised representative model um, where <clears throat> each of the either corporate authorised representatives or principal authorised representatives enter into a contractual relationship with uh, the um, licensee, one of the three licensees. And what kind of remuneration do employed financial planners receive? Employed financial planners receive a um, salary and then they are eligible to receive uh, an incentive based on a what's called a balanced scorecard, which we referred to earlier. And how often is that incentive payment or bonus, that's what it is, it's a bonus? Yes. How often is the bonus paid? Six monthly. Okay. And prior to the changes that uh, uh, we've seen in the document we've been provided this morning, uh, the update, the 2018 update, prior to that document, what determined whether a financial planner was entitled to receive a bonus? The fin financial planner would be entitled to be eligible for a bonus if they um, crossed certain hurdles, if you like, and they are things such as um, having to pass um, their audits, um, deliver 100% of their annual reviews for ongoing service, um, meet uh, certain um, uh, ANZ values and behaviours, uh, complete mandatory compliance training and then they would um, they would pass into eligibility for a um, bonus which would be determined by reference to a weighted balanced scorecard. Mm -hmm. So prior to these changes was the bonus calculated by reference to the amount of revenue brought in by the financial planner? Uh, prior to the changes, there was 15% um, of the scorecard that was associated with either new revenue at, or total revenue. Mm -hmm. And how long had that uh, scorecard approach with 15% assigned to that factor been in place? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, was it in place prior to the FOFA reforms? My recollection is that a balanced scorecard was introduced sometime after the, um, as the FOFA reforms came in. I, I'm, my role came in in April 2014 and there was a balanced scorecard in place um, at that time to my recollection. Well, you tell us in paragraph 129 of your statement that the balanced scorecard approach came in in October 2015. Is that... Um, can I turn to yes, my witness yes, statement? Yes, it will come onto the screen as well. It's page 63 of your statement, paragraph 129. Yes, that's correct. So this balance scorecard approach came in in October 2015. And how were bonus payments determined before the balance scorecard approach? Uh, I, do, I don't know the answer to that, I'm sorry. Well, could I take you again to another paragraph in your statement, to paragraph 47, on page 53. You see there that Prior to the introduction of FOFA, you say that ANZ Financial Planning had a culture of emphasising the growth of business more than the best interests of the client. And this was reflected in the criteria considered by ANZ and the weighting applied to that cr criteria in its decisions to reward and recognise financial advisors and the less punitive consequences when inappropriate advice was identified. 
and you go on to say that, for example, prior to 1 July 2013, when ANZ determined the financial rewards to advisers, it placed greater emphasis on how the financial advisor had grown business as opposed to the quality of the services provided to clients. Further incentives could be achieved on an advisor's financial performance, even if that advisor did not meet basic requirements in respect of matters such as training. And you then say that is no longer the case, with incentives now assessed against a range of new factors, including client satisfaction, service delivery and participation in coaching and collaboration. So why did ANZ decide to change its approach? To the scorecard, do you, do you mean? Well, away from what you describe in your statement as the culture of emphasising the growth of business more than the best interests of the client. Uh, well, m uh, my understanding was that from the time that FOFA was introduced, there was a growing realisation that um, there needed to be greater emphasis in the remuneration incentives based on um, other factors. Um, and there were also regulatory impediments um, that were driving changes to the remuneration as well. Why did ANZ need the FOFA reforms to tell it to emphasise the best interests of the client rather than the growth of the business? I think the FOFA reforms was a trigger to look at remuneration more broadly. And if I think back, there has been, whilst I don't remember all of the changes, I do recollect that there has been um, there has been a continual evolution or changing to um, that scorecard to create a greater emphasis on other measures such as risk and compliance and customer measures. Um, over the over the period since then, I see. But up until the document that we've been provided today, the April two thousand and eighteen document, that scorecard still included revenue measures uh, to determine the amount of a bonus that a financial planner would receive. Yes, that's true. And is it still the case that the scorecard for management managers of financial planners include a revenue component? Yes, it is. And what component of the management's, the management scorecard relates to revenue? Uh, it is in my exhibits, um, I believe my recollection is it is 15%. Um, <laughs> and why has that not been removed? I, I don't know, I'm not sure. Right. Why were the changes made to the scorecards for financial planners? Why was revenue removed from those? Um, I don't know all of the factors. It's very recent. I haven't had a chance to um, understand them all, but I understand one of them. Um, one factor was the um, January 18 changes to the life insurance reforms and um, a um, understanding that the there would be greater complexity in um, uh, in those types of um, revenue measures being applied to the scorecard for financial planners. I see. Could I just ask you to look at a couple of pages of the document we've received this morning? Um, we we don't have a document ID for that, but the last exhibit. And could I ask that you turn to the fourth page of that document? Do, do I understand this heading, the change for 1H18, to be a reference to the change for the first half of 2018? Is yes, that what that's, that... that's correct. Okay. And we see on the left-hand side what's not changing, and in the second half of the page, what's changing? Yes, that's correct. So one of the what's not changing, the third tick there, 
revenue remains an important measure of the financial health of the business, the BUIP incentive payment pool remains dependent on overall advice and distribution business performance. What is the BUIP incentive payment pool? Uh, that BUIP stands for Business Unit Incentive Plan, and that's referring to the overall um, amount of money referred to as the bonus pool or BUI pool that is available for distribution as an incentive to the pool of advisors in ANZ FP. So the system is still related to revenue then because the amount of money that is available for distribution as a bonus to a financial planner is dependent on the revenue that all financial planners have brought into the business. Yes, it is dependent on the financial um, performance of the business, that's true. Well, it's dependent on the performance of the financial planners in the advice and distribution part of the business. Yes, that's true, yes. And in the second half of the document, what's changing? The second matter there is leaderboards no longer published. What leaderboards were published prior to this document? I have a general understanding of the leadership boards, but not a detailed one, so I can explain that. I believe that they are um, a type of measure which ranks um, advisors on certain criteria, um, of which I'm, I'm not aware of all of the detail. So from high, high to low. Yes, and we would assume, would we not, that it was the criteria that applied in the score cr scorecard prior to this time, so it would have included reference to revenue brought in? Yes, I presume it would have included that. So there were leaderboards for, that reflected the amount of revenue uh, that financial planners were bringing into the ANZ financial planning business? Yes, that would have been a factor that drove, um, that drove the, the performance of a, of a planner up to 15%. And what does that say, Ms Rickson, about the culture within ANZ financial planning um, uh, for financial planners when there are leaderboards on which the amount of revenue that they have generated for the business is displayed in comparison with other ANZ financial planning planners? Uh, well, revenue is just one of the factors um, within that leaderboard. It uh, makes up 15% of the scorecard. Other measures such as customer satisfaction and uh, risk and, and process measures also drive whether someone is higher or lower on the leaderboard. Yes, um, but my but question to you is about the inclusion of revenue generation as a component of the leaderboard and I'd like you to consider what that means for the culture that is created by ANZ Financial Planning that these matters are published on leaderboards which compare financial planners according to the revenue they've generated. Well, yes, I think it can, where, where revenue is one of the drivers, I think it can um, provide, um, you know, a, 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 an impression that is something that um, we would like not to be there. And so we have taken those leaderboards away, despite the fact that they include other measures, not just revenue, um, they can be interpreted that way. Do you think it's possible to create uh, a remuneration system for your financial advisors in ANZ Financial Planning that incentivises quality advice? Have you considered leaderboards that rank financial advisors according to the provision of quality advice? I'm not aware of what other um, options or considerations we might have made into le in leaderboards, but yes, I do consider it's possible to do that. And what would that system look like? Well, I haven't turned my mind um, to that, but I could think of um, measures such as net promoter score, which is a measure of customer satisfaction, so people who had outperformed on, um, on those uh, scores, as well as things like people who have um, scored very highly in their audits. There may well be others, I'm sorry, I just haven't turned my mind to that question before. 
Can you explain to me a little more what you mean by, I think you said, net promoter score? Is that right? Can you tell me what it's measuring, how it works? It's, it's not something I know about. Uh, yes, Commissioner. It's a, it's a um, common industry um, standard measure of customer advocacy. And so surveys are um, completed by customers um, often often very soon after an experience with an advisor, um, often at later dates, I understand. And it asks questions um, that go to whether the customer feels that they would recommend that experience and that advisor to somebody else. And so it can be 100 is very high and in some areas is considered in world class. And it can also be negative, so that is, um, where a customer was a detractor. In other words, they said, not only am I neutral, but I wouldn't recommend this experience or this advisor. Yes, thank you. How would this hypothetical system of um, uh, rewarding and incentivising quality advice um, reflect situations where quality advice is telling the customer to do nothing? to keep their situation as it is? Well, our, our balance scorecard already has a measure of um, uh, some of those things that go towards that. So for example, um, the measure in the scorecard of qualified referrals is a measure which um, uh, where, where a, a customer um, can come in to an advisor and sit down with the advisor and the advisor does not believe that the person um, needs that advice, for example, because of the circumstances, or they don't need personal advice that will obviously cost them more money for a much more simple need. So in that measure, the measure isn't, isn't the outcome being um, a plan or you know, a piece of personal advice. The measure is, has the customer actually sat down and had a conversation with that customer and they get um, rewarded for that as well. So. Does your revised balance scorecard dealt with in this document apply to financial planners within ANZ's aligned dealer groups? Uh, no, it does not. It only applies to the salaried planners. So all of the financial planners in the aligned dealer groups still have bonuses calculated by reference to revenue brought in? Well, no, in the sense that um, they are um, authorised representatives or corporate authorised representatives and they are effectively small business owners that are um, aligned to through a contractual relationship to our licensee, which means that they receive the revenue, like another small business owner would, um, for um, uh, the business that they write, the, the advices that they give, which could be fee for services. It could also be uh, you know, allowable um, commissions, for example. Mm. But this scorecard, with its non-revenue measures, has no application to them. That, that's correct. Yes. yes. And do you accept my proposition to you that their bonuses within their groups are calculated by reference to their generation of revenue? Uh, yes, they, um, they may well be. What, what are the benefits of having employed financial advisors as opposed to authorised representatives? Well, in my role as a Chief Risk Officer, I would say that one of the benefits of having an employed advisor network is that it is easier to um, create uniformity across um, a pool of people or across that business because um, you can create uniformity through um, creating central um, services, for example, it could be an ongoing service contract um, or other measures, scorecards that um, must apply to all of those advisors. 
So what does that mean the main challenges are that are associated with using authorised representatives instead of employees to provide financial advice? I think there can be greater diversity in, um, or there is greater diversity in the practices and processes that they apply. Um, but that's not always the case. So for example, some um, licensees like FSP, one of their value propositions is to have very standardised, uniform advice processes and everyone using the same system across their network and so that you know attracts um, advisors who um, come in and, and then um, um, apply that kind of um, systems and processes. For other um, licensees um, there may be more variability in terms of, in fact there is more variability in terms of things like the um, ongoing service contracts, that they apply, um, the systems that they use and the related advice processes. You've referred a few times in your answers, um, the last couple of answers to uniformity. Why is uniformity important? Why is that an objective here? <clears throat> well, well, it's... <laughs> It's, um, its importance, in my view, stems from um, the ability to, to do two things. One is to provide, invest in and provide um, guide rails, if you like, or support for the advisor to um, move through the advice process in the most efficient and f effective manner that lowers the risk of them making mistakes or something go, going wrong. The second reason that uniformity is important in my view is that it increases the ability to monitor the control environment. Is it more difficult to um, implement effective compliance systems in the aligned dealer groups than it is for your own financial planning business? Uh, yes, in some part, it depends on what type of control that um, we're talking about. Is it generally more difficult? Um, that, that's a difficult question because there's, there's lots of controls in a control environment. I could give you an example. Let me, let me put it another way. What are the controls that are more difficult uh, to implement in the aligned dealer group framework than they are with your employed financial advisors? Uh, so, <clears throat> where, um, so one example is um, the um, use of a single centralised advice system. So we, we now have almost all advisors in the aligned dealer groups on a central um, advice system, but they're not all using it uniformly. And that creates more difficulties in terms of monitoring, um, the monitoring that we would do over that system and, um, and also the guide rails and assistance that you know, we, that might be provided um, through um, a, um, a system where we can uniformly roll out things like little wizards that sort of help them through the advice process. So someone who is in another type of practice that isn't on a centralised advice system may well have all of that in place, but it is not connected up to our central system and it makes it harder for us to... So what, see that. why aren't the authorised representatives under each of your aligned dealer groups all on that centralised advice system? <clears throat> well, I think historically there has been um, 
and this is sort of prior to 18 months ago when we started a program of work to encourage and incentivise, I think there was a lot of focus that was put on other parts of the control environment um, post FOFA and we, um, we were conscious, the business was conscious of the fact that there was no contractual obligation for um, these practices to use X plan. Since that time, um, I think we have recognised, it's been a growing recognition of how important that is and have used other measures to, if not legally mandate, strongly encourage and incentivise um, advice practices to move on to that plan or to essentially part ways with us. Right. In your statement, Ms Rickson, you've set out the number of employed financial advisors of ANZ and the number of individual authorised representatives of the various aligned dealer groups. Uh, in each year from 2008, you've given us those figures. Yes, I have. And what we see from that is that in 2008, there were 514 employed financial advisors uh, and 865 individual authorised representatives, um, coming to a total of 1,379 advisors. Do you, do you want the reference to the part um, of yes, your could I that please? deals with this? It's a table at um, paragraph 22 of your statement. Do you see that there on page five of your statement? It's on the screen as well, Ms Rickson. Yes, I do. So um, 1,379 advisors in total in 2008, and as I said, 514 employed and 865 were authorised representatives. Then if we move through to 2013, we see that you had 406 employed financial advisors, so th those numbers had gone down, and 736 individual authorised representatives, uh, a total of 1,145 on my maths. So the total number of financial advisors had decreased from 2008. Yes, yes. And at the moment, if we go over the page to page six to look at the current figures, ANZ in 2018 has 277 employed financial advisors, that's the first column, uh, and in total 602 authorised representatives, that's the addition of those um, second, third and fourth columns, which on my maths takes us to a total in this year of 879 financial advisors. Yes. So across your wealth entities, ANZ currently has about 500 fewer financial advisors than it did 10 years ago in 2008. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And why has ANZ decreased the number of financial advisors that it employs or authorises so significantly? Uh, well, I think I'll talk about the aligned dealer groups versus ANZFP separately, if that's okay, because yes, they're separate. Of course. So, um, in relation to ANZFP, um, there has so I, I don't know all the factors, but I know one of, or two of the factors has been that we have um, exited um, or performance managed a number of advisors out of the business who have not met the ANZ standards. So, for example, we have performance managed 71 um, advisors in ANZFP just in the last 12 months, and over half of them have exited the business through resignation or termination. The other reason is um, it is becoming harder and harder to recruit the right people who we think have the right standards and qualifications. Um, in the aligned dealer groups, um, once again, I don't know all of the factors for why it has decreased. Um, I think, um, so my understanding is that um, the same 
holds true from a practice perspective in terms of it being more difficult to find practices who um, meet the required um, ANZ standards, if you like. And the second thing is that we had an active over the last, um, I think it would be 18 months, I, I'm not sure of the exact period, uh, of tail, what's called tail management. And so that effectively involved um, parting ways through one way or another with practices that um, the, the business felt um, were not of value or of higher risk to the organisation. There's a few things that you've said there that I just want to sure. follow up with you. Um, firstly, is it the case that ANZ's standards of its financial advisors have changed over this 10-year period? Um, yes, in the sense, in a couple of ways. I think um, that the, the standards in general have, you know, so in terms of qualifications, um, and so on, we have raised those standards. And um, we have also, um, uh, I guess, tightened up, if you like, um, the onboarding processes in terms of what um, may well have come through as an exception to our onboarding processes in previous years um, for particular advisors that now we would not accept. So why have the standards changed? I think that has been a growing um, understanding and response to um, the, um, the onerous Yeah, a growing response to the um, environment, the increasingly um, onerous requirements of both our own ANZ standards and the growing regulatory prescription, um, and our own um, desire to um, create a culture where um, the client is at the centre of it, and that has not always been the case in the past. What's the growing regulatory prescription? Um, well, if I turn, I guess, my mind back a, a few years, what, what I can see is I've sort of had the opportunity to look back through um, uh, and absorb imp information um, since... Um, the introduction of FOFA, what I can see is that whilst the regulations and the, the Act um, set out what the um, requirements are, in my view there's been a growing um, level of understanding, well, not understanding but prescription of those um, of what those requirements might translate to in relation to parts of the advice process. So. Um, for example, ANZ standards in relation to not just um, um, there needs to be file notes and they need to contain certain things, but the, the quality of those file notes, how, what we accept in terms of the format, etc. Um, ASIC has released regulatory guidance like um, 413 on insurance, which has given um, the industry since FOFA, I think there's been a number of those sorts of reports and where um, the industry has started to get more information and understanding of what the requirements are and the level of prescription um, has changed through those advice processes. Is this part of the move away from what we saw you described in another part of your statement as the previous culture, which was a culture of prioritising the growth of the business over the best interests of the clients? Sorry, could you just repeat the question? So I, I wanted to understand, understand if these changes in standards in response to what you described as growing regulatory prescription were part of the cultural change that you've referred to in your statement away from a culture of prioritising the growth of the business over 
the best interests of the clients. I mean, yes, in the sense that they have focused the business and the advisors on the importance of having a demonstrating um, that that not not only not only going through the advice steps in a manner that is prescribed, but being able to demonstrate in a lot of detail after the fact how they actually reach those conclusions. So yes, in the sense of um, focusing um, on the, you know, a growing importance, if you like, of um, that evidentiary um, trail. But do you accept my linking of that to the reference in your statement to the past culture, which prioritised growth of the ANZ business over the best interests of the client? I mean, yes, I, th I think they're linked. Okay. You, you said that you'd exited or performance managed 71 advisors out of ANZ financial planning, is that right? Yes. Over the last 12 months. Sorry, performance managed, not exited all of them, exited over half of them. Exited over half of yep. them and performance, performance managed, managed the rest. 71. So they're all performance managed. I see. I, I can explain that if you'd like the me to. The difference between performance managing and exiting? No, the performance management process. No, I'm not, not as um, concerned about the process. I want to understand what sort of conduct on the part of those financial advisors led to them being performance managed. Um, so I don't, I don't know the detail of, um, of those cases. I have a general understanding of um, what some of them might be. Could you tell us about that? Sure. Um, so some of those people are um, <clears throat> planners who um, may have um, been, you know, on vetting, and so you know, a new advisor or advisor with new accreditation who is on vetting, vetting, and goes into phase two of vetting or phase three of vetting. In other words, can't. Um, doesn't show an ability to be able to meet the standards that are required. Um, so they could be new advisors. They could be advisors where the supervisor um, has um, uh, recognised that in some way or other, um, it could be behaviours, it could be um, the, um, the way that they're applying certain processes, that there is an issue there. and. Um, the process involves strategies to either help them to meet the standard or to terminate them. And many of them resign if, if, they're, if they're in the, um, that process. Many of them also resign during that time as well. Has there been a conscious decision to reduce the number of financial advisors providing advice for ANZ financial planning? Not that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. Do you think that large numbers of financial advisors present difficulties for ensuring compliance? <clears throat> um, it, it really does depend on the um, The kind of systems and processes, and how technologically how technologically enabled they are. Do you think that in the past, ANZ's um, compliance systems have been adequate to ensure that large numbers of financial advisors were complying with their legal obligations? Um, no, in some instances and for some periods um, our systems and processes have had deficiencies in them. Has there been a lack of investment by ANZ in the systems and processes that are needed to ensure compliance? Yes in some cases and no in some cases. And yes in which cases? <clears throat> so I would, so in my view I would say that um, 
uh, on reflection, ANZ um, could have um, commenced the program to move to encourage and incentivise the aligned dealer groups onto X Plan, onto the centralised version of X Plan earlier than it did. That would have also enabled the what's referred to in my witness statement as the advisor hub, which is the consolidation, the, the consolidation of all of the information from different systems um, into one easily accessible database um, could also have been commenced earlier. Mm -hmm. And how much earlier should those two things have happened? That, that's a really difficult question. I, I, I don't years know. Earlier? Should they have happened years earlier than they have? I don't, I mean, so, so certainly, um, I don't know whether that was possible years earlier. It was certainly possible a significant amount of time earlier than what we did. Yes, but what, what are you referring to when you refer to a significant amount of time? Uh, well, so um, it, it, it could have been um, as part of all of when we transitioned to centralisation in 2013 um, through that FOFA period. Yeah. Thank you. Has ANZ considered divesting its financial advice business? Uh, well, we have already um, sold um, the majority of our the businesses that make up our wealth division to um, uh, to purchases. Why? Uh, well, <clears throat> I haven't been a party to the board or executive committee discussions on why um, the businesses were sold. Um, my understanding from um, what has been communicated to me is that it was it is part of the strategy for ANZ return, to return to its core uh, business of banking and um, to improve its capital efficiency and um, uh, ANZ um, no longer f felt it wanted to be in the business of product manufacturing um, in terms of wealth such as life and, in, and superannuation. And do you know why ANZ didn't want to be in the business of product manufacturing? Uh, well, as I said, it's, it it's part, was part, my understanding is that it was part of the core strategy to, um, uh, to um, focus on the core um, products and services, the core banking products and services, and it also is not a very capital efficient business, of life insurance, for example, mm -hmm. as compared to banking. You also set Sorry, out as compared to banking. banking. You also set out in your statement the number of employees that you have involved in uh, monitoring and supervising financial advisors. You deal with that in paragraph 33 of your statement, Ms Rickson. It's page yes. 45. Yes. yes. Um, and what types of things are the employees that you've referred to there, the employees involved in monitoring and supervising advisors, what types of things are they responsible for? <coughs> Well, in the um, first, um, so the columns that relate to each uh, licensed entity, those um, roles ref um, refer to um, mostly roles such as uh, what we would call practice, practice managers, <coughs> state managers, practice development managers, and they are in effect um, in ANZFP line supervisors, so they're who um, the advisors report to and who supervise them from um, day to day basis. And in the aligned dealer groups, they are, um, pra there are practice development managers who also have a supervisory role and take care of or are responsible for a certain um, uh, 
region or number of practices within the aligned dealer groups. So we see from the figures in your table here that in 2008 uh, there were, on my maths, 88 and a half full-time employees across ANZ Financial Planning and the three aligned dealer group companies um, who were responsible for supervising and monitoring the figure that we saw before, which is 1,379 advisors. Yes. So on my maths, that's about one monitoring or supervising officer for every 15 advisors. Uh, I haven't done the maths, but I will assume that's correct. And we also know that those employees worked for particular entities so that there were more monitors or supervisors in some entities than there were in others. We can see that from your table. Yes. So for Millennium 3, for example, there were only 17 employees involved in monitoring and supervising. And we know from your other table uh, that there were 479 Millennium 3 advisors. So that's about one supervisor for every 28 advisors. Yes. Uh, and you tell us in your statement that in 2012, uh, ANZ centralised part of its compliance function so that there were some employees who then provided services across all four entities and others that worked in the particular entities. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And then if we move beyond that in 2013, again on my maths there are 66 and a half people involved in the supervision and monitoring of financial advisors across the four entities and they're responsible for 1,145 advisors, which is about one for every 17 advisors. Yes. So between 2008 and 2013, the ratio of supervising employees to advisors declined, it got worse. Yes. And at the moment, in 2018, if we go to the following page, um, on my maths, again, uh, there are 82.9 supervisors or monitors across the four entities, and they're responsible for 879 advisors. We know that from your other table. So that's about one for every 10 advisors. Yes. Do you think that's an adequate ratio to ensure that customers receive good quality advice from ANZ financial advisors? Uh, yes, I do in 2018, yes. And why is it only in 2018 that ANZ's achieved that ratio? Well, I think it's been sufficient in some of the earlier years as well. Um, the focus that um, we have had in since 2015 has been the um, activities that those supervisors are focused on as well, the ones in the, in the individual licensed entities. Mm -hmm. You've also given us a table in your statement showing the number of identified instances of inappropriate advice provided to, cu to customers of ANZ and the authorised representatives in each calendar year from 2008. And you deal with that in paragraph 34 of your statement. It's in the second half of this page. Yes. Um, and you tell us in your statement that the information in this table includes cases where there just wasn't enough information on the file to identify whether or not the advice was appropriate? Uh, yes, that's right. How can it be that you don't have enough information on client files to determine whether the, inf the advice that was given was appropriate? Uh, well, I believe that's referring to cases that are under investigation, um, that are going through remediation. And during that process, um, what um, sometimes happens is that there needs to be a, as part of the remediation process, a case assessor has to 
um, uh, reconstruct, if you like, um, some of the evidence to determine whether, in fact, um, the what the advice outcome should have been or ought to have been to put the customer back into um, the situation that they should have been in. So for some of those cases, there there um, isn't evidence, but we have, if we know, if we have constructed, done that construction, we have and done the case assessment and found it to be an inappropriate outcome, we've included that as an instance. So does that mean that you've restricted the information in this table to instances where uh, the advice of the advisor has been called into question in some way and there is an investigation or reconstruction, as you described it, underway to work out whether the advice is inappropriate? Uh, no, it also includes um, uh, audit results as well. Mm -hmm. So audit results and instances where the advice has been called into question. Uh, yes, and incidents and complaints and um, uh, cases that have gone to our customer advocacy in some years, but not all. Um, and sorry, that, that's the only ones I could recollect. There may be others I've mentioned in Have my statement. Have you identified every instance of inappropriate advice given to customers over this period by an ANZ financial planning advisor or one of the authorised representatives of these three groups? Uh, no, in the sense that um, if the question is, have we identified any possible instance that there could be? Um, we don't know um, how many possible instances there could be in the whole of the um, of the business. That is how many that have been detected, and we've taken a cautious approach to how we've answered that question. Mm -hmm. um, through the process that I've described in my witness statement. So it's only the instances you're aware of? That's correct. And then you've excluded things from this table. You tell us in your statement that you've excluded advice that's currently under investigation as potentially inappropriate. Yes, so that was what I referred to earlier where a case officer might be reviewing the files or that there is files in the queue um, to be reviewed. Mm -hmm. So that suggests that these figures will understate the ultimate figures, is that right? Uh, in some cases, but there's also double counting in those um, numbers as well. You've also excluded from the table analysis of records filed electronically in electronic systems of your aligned dealer groups? For certain earlier periods, yes. And you've excluded analysis of hard copy records held by your aligned dealer groups prior to July 2014 because you tell us it's not practicable to interrogate that source of data? Uh, yes, in the time that we had available, that's correct. So shouldn't those records have been kept in a way that allows ANZ to review them in a timely fashion to decide whether the advice that's been given is appropriate? Uh, well, in this case, we're referring to audit results that were in hard copy. Um, we, we don't track um, the... So we've been responsive to this, this question and taken a cautious approach, but we don't track um, inappropriate advice in the way that is responsive to this question. Do, do you mean by that that it's not possible to identify every instance of inappropriate advice. Yes, as I said before, that's correct, but we do track, um, we do track instances of inappropriate advice in a number of different ways. Mm. Through the audit process, you said, through customer complaints, through your customer advocate. Uh, yes, so while well, we track inappropriate advice through um, uh, advisors, so advisors where their um, conduct has found to warrant further investigation. Um, that, so we track it through those advisors. Then we track the potential impacted customers from in relation to those advisors. We track um, the results of the case ass assessments for those cases for each of those advisors, um, what the themes of the detriment have been. 
um, whether there has been financial detriment or non-financial detriment um, offers that of compensation that have been made. We track um, audit results and themes from different audit um, questions that may show trends relating to inappropriate advice and they're discussed at the risk forums. Um, we track um, complaints and trends in complaints. Um, we track incidents um, and, and also theme those and look at trends in incidents as well. And so um, advice, advisor, audit failures, for example, and other incidents that may not arise as a result of audits are also tracked through the incident management systems. They're the ones I can recollect at the moment. So with all the caveats and exclusions <coughs> that you've identified in your statement about this table, um, we can see that your table identifies that the total number of identified instances of inappropriate advice in 2008 was 60. Uh, yes, that's, that's correct. And then if we go to 2013, uh, the total number of instances on my maths is 191. Uh, yes. And then in 2014, it goes up again to 1,041. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm going to assume your maths yes. is correct. Yes, I'm uh, sorry, because we don't have a total column in your table. Yeah, I understand. Uh, I'm sorry for that. No, no, that's all right. Um, but what I want to suggest to you is that there is an escalation in the total number of instances of inappropriate advice that are identified. As I said, in 2014, it was 1,000 and, I'm sorry, 1,401. And then in 2015, it goes up to 2,810. In 2016, it's 2,499, a slight dip. But what I want to ask you about is why there's such a steep increase in the number of instances of inappropriate advice in your table in those years. So, so that's years 2014? Yeah. Yes, so... 15, sorry, can you just... Yes, yeah, so 2013 was 191. Yep. 2014, 1,401, yep. then 2,810, then 2,499 yes. in 2016. Yes. Um, <clears throat> well, as I said before, there is a, um, there's a number of caveats in relation to that information. Mm. So prior to 2014, there would be instances of inappropriate advice that are recorded but not recorded centrally that we've not been able to analyse in, in the time that we had. Um, since 2014 and, um, and, and certainly um, more prevalently to since 2016, we have included all um, instances of not just when an advisor fails an audit as one, but we'd actually looked through the audit questions and, um, and identified um, those questions that we believed went to the response um, uh, of 2I2 mm. and um, recorded each of those question failures as a failure. So while that has um, uh, contributed to you know, a lot of the escalation. I'd also say um, we are detecting um, many more instances now. Mm -hmm. We're detecting many more instances because our control environment has improved and because we've also done lookbacks over um, years as well and identified other instances. So you say you're detecting more instances and the control environment has improved. 
And we've also seen um, from the evidence in your statement I took you to earlier that the number of advisers across the wealth entities has reduced. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And the ratio of monitoring and supervision has generally improved. Yes. All right. So do those changes suggest that there's likely to be at least a similar number of instances of inappropriate advice in the earlier period, but you haven't been able to identify them because you had so many more advisers, you had inferior compliance systems and processes, and you had inferior monitoring and supervision? I can't say for sure what the number of inappropriate instances should be, and as I said before, there are instances that have been identified but that are not included in these numbers. Um, it is certainly the case that our, not all, but many of our um, controls have improved over, the time, over the, that period and our supervision numbers um, have increased. Well, could I just take you to some documents from the period prior to 2015? Yes. That's the period when your table suggests that there were far fewer instances of inappropriate advice. Um, and the first is ANZ 800 <coughs> We see that this is a report to the Risk and Compliance Board Committee prepared for its meeting on the 17th of August 2015. <coughs> Do you see that, Ms Rickson? Uh, you have it's it on the screen. It's not part of your statement. It was part of Mr Werritt's statement. Right, OK. Can you see that that's a report to the Risk and Compliance Board Committee prepared for the meeting on the 17th of August 2015? Yes. And could I ask that you look at page 1507, which will come up on the screen? And this is a table that summarises the results of advice quality reviews. That's an, a compliance audit, is that right? Yes, it is. Uh, conducted across ANZ Financial Planning, RI Advice, Millennium 3 and Financial Services Partners in the period from 1 June 2013 to 30 June 2015. Do you see that date range in the heading? Uh, yes. So at this time and now advisers were audited at least annually? Yes, that's correct. And if an audit identified an issue, it was rated as high, medium or low, depending on how significant it was? Yes, that's correct. And what this table shows us is the top high rated issues identified in audits over this period. Uh, yes, I think that's right. Sorry, I haven't seen this document before. Um, we see from this document that the top high rated issue from audits in this period is a failure to comply with the requirement that the advice is likely to be in the best interests of the client. Yes, I can see that. And in ANZ financial planning, 5% of files didn't comply with that requirement. Yes. And the results roughly the same in RI advice and Millennium 3. Yes, that, that's right. And we know from your statement that those three companies consistently account for the majority of ANZ's employed financial advisers and authorised representatives. 
Yes, that's correct. So across those three co companies, 5% or one in every 20 pieces of advice given to customers failed to meet the requirement that the advice was likely to be in the best interests of the client. Uh, of the sample selected, yes, that's correct. Okay, and if we turn to the following page, 1508, this is a similar table that shows the top rated medium, medium rated issues from the audits in this period. Yes, that's correct. And we see that the top medium rated requirement that was not met um, was the advice document discusses the expected advantages and implications of the recommended strategy. Yes, that's right. And in ANZ financial planning, 10% of the audited files failed to meet that requirement. Yes, that's right. And in Millennium 3, it was over 15%. Yes, that's correct. And the fourth most common issue flagged as a medium rated issue here was a failure to comply with the requirement that the advisor has taken appropriate steps to conduct relevant product research. Yes, that's correct. And in ANZ financial planning, almost 7% of the files failed that requirement. Yes, that's correct. And in Millennium 3, it was almost 10 per cent? Yes, that's correct. How can advice be in the best interests of a client if the advisor has not taken appropriate steps to conduct relevant product research? Well, clearly the advisor hasn't gone through the steps that are um, required to, or there is no evidence, um, one or the other, um, that the advisor has not gone through the steps required to do the product research. Um, they may or may not have done that, and that may or may not have um, resulted in a detriment um, to the customer. Hmm, but what these audits are showing us is that um, the files do not establish that these things were done. Yes, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. And the audits are meant to be representative. What's sampled in an audit is meant to be representative of what's occurring across the business. Yes, that's true. Yes. And if we then turn to 1510, we see there that at this time in Millennium 3, 11% of the advisors were providing advice to customers that were rated as high risk advisors. Yes, that's right. And 6% um, of ANZ financial planning Advisors were high risk advisors providing advice to customers? Yes, that's correct. Do you think these results are acceptable? Uh, no, I think they're very regrettable. Mm. And these results indicate, don't they, that at least in this period prior to 2015, ANZ systems and processes weren't adequate to ensure that customers were given appropriate advice? Uh, Yes, in the sense that many of them had deficiencies in them. Yes. Um, would you agree that ANZ's been aware for many years that there was a high risk that its customers would receive inappropriate advice? Uh, no, I, I don't agree 
with that. All right, could I show you some documents? The first is ANZ 800 038 3565. Do you see, Ms Rickson, that this is a presentation to the Business Risk and Compliance Committee by Mr Stephen Blood, the Head of Risk and Compliance Solutions in January 2014? Commissioner, I'm sorry to interrupt. I indicated to my learned friend that this uh, witness prefers to have documents in hard copy where possible. We have a hard copy of this particular document, if that's convenient. Yes, thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Ms Rickson, what was the role of the Business Risk and Compliance Committee? The, the role of the Business Risk and Compliance Committee is the Divisional Risk Committee uh, that is responsible for the oversight of the risk management framework uh, for the wealth division. Thank you. Could I ask you to turn to 3566 in this document, the second page? And we see there that the purpose of this paper is to seek committee approval of global advice and distributions residual high risk until 30 June 2014. Yes, I do. And the background is that on the 11th of December 2013, advice and distributions residual high risk of delivery of non-compliant advice and financial services had been submitted to the committee for acceptance. Yes, I do see that. What does it mean to accept risk? Uh, the, the risk acceptance under the ANZ framework is an acceptance of the um, so first of all, the business does an assessment of uh, the risks using a probability and um, consequence um, methodology. And the um, role of the Business Risk and Compliance Committee is to review the proposed treatments for that um, risk to lower that risk down to a, um, a lower level and to um, accept or not those treatments and the timeframes on which um, they are um, required to be completed and then to oversight the progress of that. So this document is January 2014 and we see on this page that at the December 2013 committee meeting, the committee had decided not to accept the risk at that time and had asked for a more detailed description of the risk, associated controls and rationale as to why the treatments would reduce the risk to minimum. Yes, I see that. And then at this meeting, a risk treatment acceptance plan was submitted. Yes, that's correct. Uh, and we see at on this same page that the recommendation of the committee at this meeting was to approve the risk treatment acceptance plan for the high residual risk of delivery of non-compliant advice and financial services until 30 June 2014. Yes, that's correct. So the risk is accepted at this meeting? The risk treatment plan is accepted, yes. And if we turn to 356A, we see Appendix A. Sorry, what, what number was it? 3568. Yes. This is the risk treatment plan acceptance. Yes. And we see that the risk description there is the delivery of non-compliant advice and financial services, which is described as the risk of significant reportable breaches of the legal requirements relating to the provision of financial advice and services to clients? Yes, that's correct. And the key scenario for the risk is the failure to provide advice that's in the best interests of the client? That's correct. 
and further down in that row, ANZ is exposed to this risk in the context of four separate licensee businesses, each of which have different value propositions, operating models and systems, 1,300 geographically dispersed advisors providing personal financial advice to clients in accordance with principles-based legislation, which is both complex and onerous, and formulation, production and implementation of advice is largely conducted by advisors without preventative oversight. Why no preventative oversight, Ms Rickson? I'm, I'm not certain what the author of this document was referring to then um, with that comment. There certainly, as, as I understand it, I wasn't in my role then, but there certainly were preventative controls such as onboarding and due diligence, etc., in place, so I don't know what that is exactly referring to. Sorry. We then see in the next row the impact of acceptance of this risk. And we see that that's divided into four different impacts. A compliance impact. These events would be breaches of key regulatory requirements contained in the Corporations Act, ASIC Act and a AFSL conditions. We would expect a number of insignificant instances each year that are not systemic. Some breaches could result in regulatory reporting action. However, ANZ would generally be left to manage its own rectification activities and this is described as a moderate consequence. Yes, that's correct. And then there's recognition that the compliance breaches would also lead to the following financial and reputation impacts. Financial loss is equated to an expectation that there would be up to, and Commissioner, there are redactions in this document that I've discussed with my friend this morning, they have been made in error and I will read the um, figures that have been redacted and this document will be replaced in the online court book. Commissioner, may I just indicate, I apologise to my learned friend, I did give that indication earlier that the redactions were in, er in error. It's subsequently been checked. They were not in error, but um, ANZ does consent to the information being, being read out and the redactions will be removed as my learned friend indicated. Thank you. So the compliance breaches would also lead to the following financial and reputation impacts. Financial loss is equated to an expectation that there would be up to $10 million in client complaint losses and $10 million in remediation, $20 million in total. This would equate to a moderate loss. Yes, I see that. So you see there the committee is being told that it's a moderate loss to ANZ um, to have $10 million in client complaint losses and $10 million in additional remediation? Yes, I see that. There's also a reference to reputation. These events and the events that we're referring to are delivery of non-compliant advice and financial services could bring about a moderate consequence to reputation with limited national media coverage and or some customer loss. Yes, I see that. And the residual risk assessment is that the residual risk has been assessed as a high risk based on a moderate consequence and probability of moderately likely. Yes, I see that. And the committee is asked to accept the high residual risk until the 30th of June 2014 and approve the associated treatment plans and timelines. Yes, I see that. And then we come to the, uh, a summary of um, what is said to justify that acceptance of risk. There are 10 key controls in place and they're detailed on subsequent pages and the acceptance period provides sufficient time for advice and distribution to complete the treatment of five of the controls assessed to be ineffective and conduct operational effectiveness testing of those controls which have been treated and are now perceived to be effective. Yes, that's right. And can I just take you to the discussion of those controls at 3570? 
You see there the reference to controls testing outcome and number of ineffective controls. Five ineffective controls have been identified. Yes, I see that. And we see from the next row down that those five ineffective controls are identified as relating to advice assurance, consequence management of advisors, approved product list governance process, licensee standards and advice document management. Yes, I see that. And if we turn to 3572, we see a reference to one of those ineffective controls, which was the licensee standards. Yes, they I see were rated that. as not effective. Yes, I see that. Because there were gaps that existed in a number of existing licensee <laughs> standards that are overdue for review and update. Uh, yes, there were a number of licensee standards that were overdue for review. I agree with that. And at 3573, another of the ineffective controls was advice assurance, that's audits and pre-vetting. Yes, I see that. Um, and a further control that was rated as ineffective at 3574 was the consequence management framework. Uh, sorry, which one are you on to now? Row 7 on page 3574. Yes, although I do note on page 3573 there seems to be an inconsistency in the um, rating there. And I'm not sure why that was. As I said, I, I'm, I was only looking at this document historically, but it does say although it rates the advice assurance control as not effective over in the description, it's, it then says that the existing advice assurance and preventing controls are perceived to be operating effectively. I think this actually is talking about other surrounding controls. Yep. You accept that this was advice assurance and preventing of advice was identified as an ineffective control? Uh, well, it it seems to be inconsistent in that it's rated as not effective, but then the description says it is effective. And refers at the same time to management investigating improvements. It does. It talks, and it also talks then in the control gap around All the right. scope of the control being expanded. Can I take you to um, one last page in this document, which is 3581, which is a residual risk heat map? Uh, yes, I have that. And we see there that the risk of delivery of non-compliant advice and financial services, which is risk number three, is identified as being moderately likely with moderate consequences. Yes, I see that. And based on this document, the Business Risk and Compliance Committee decided to accept the high risk of delivery of non-compliant advice and financial services until the 30th of June 2014? It accepted the risk treatment plan, yes. And by doing that, accepted the risk? Well, the risk has been assessed. It's, it, it, is, it was assessed as high and the role of the Business Risk Committee was to review the treatment plan and either accept that treatment plan or not. Yes, but I just want to be clear because the language in this document at 3566 is language of seeking approval of the residual high risk. Yes, I, I can see the language, but the risk management framework is actually about accepting the treatment plan. But y sitting behind that is acceptance by the business of this ongoing risk which the business is attempting to deal with through the treatment plan. Is that right? Um, yes, it's the oversight and monitoring of that treatment plan and um, an acknowledgement that a high risk of those consequences exist. Yes. Could I attend to that document, Commissioner? Business Risk and Compliance Committee Report January 2014, ANZ 800-0383565 will be exhibit 2.154.
could I ask that you now look, Ms Rickson, at ANZ 800 0524780. There may be a hard copy uh, that can be provided to you. This is, you can see from the screen for now, the agenda for a meeting on the 26th of August 2014. Yes, I do see that. And it's a meeting of the Global Wealth Business Risk and Compliance Committee. Yes, that's right. And you were the chair of that committee? Yes, I was. And acceptance of risk for the delivery of non-compliant advice and financial services is discussed in this meeting at 4799? Yes, that's correct. And at 4798, we see that the committee approves the residual high risk for a further period until the 30th of June 2015. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. But for this <coughs> meeting, the risk is split into two. <coughs> we see this on 4798, the risk of delivery of non-compliant advice and the risk of breach of financial services licence obligations. Yes, I see that. If we turn to 4799, which is the risk treatment plan that accompanied the acceptance of this risk. We see the treatment of one of those risks, which is the breach of AFSL obligations. Yes. And this is the risk of significant reportable breaches of the legal requirements relating to the obligations and conditions arising from the holding of a licence. Yes, that's right. You see uh, further down in that row, ANZ is exposed to this risk in the context of monitoring and supervision controls are weighted towards detective controls with some preventative controls in place. Yes. And there's a reference to the 1300 advisors again. Investment in technology to enhance the advice process, provide preventative oversight of advice is lacking. Yes, I see that. Do you agree with that proposition, Ms Rickson? Uh, yes, I, and I, um, I, I think I sp spoke of that before and in my witness statement in, yes. in part, yes. And there's also a reference to increased surveillance expectations in a heightened regulatory environment. What's that referring to, Ms Rickson? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I can. Um, I don't have a strong recollection of that, but at the time that would have been around when potentially the CBA financial planning um, issue um, was out in, into the um, was being talked about externally, and um, it may have been a reference to the heightened environment. I, I'm not sure. Mm. And uh, we see there, again, um, a discussion of the impact of acceptance of the risk, which refers to financial loss, still put at $10 million in client complaint losses and $10 million in remediation, and the risk of reputation uh, damage as a moderate consequence as well. Yes, I see that. Do you accept that this document shows uh, in the um, risk description row an acceptance by ANZ that um, there wasn't a sufficient emphasis on preventative controls to ensure that customers weren't being provided with inappropriate advice? Uh, I accept that it says that we're exposed to the risk um, in that context, yes, that more preventative controls, um, sorry, preventative oversight of advice is lacking. Yes. It certainly says that. And that controls were weighted towards detective controls which identified inappropriate advice after it had been given. Uh, yes, I, I agree with that in the sense that the detective controls that were in place were direct. So in other words, like the audit process, they picked up something that either was or wasn't there. There were and have been a number of preventative controls in place in the business for um, long periods of time. But 
I, in my witness statement, I describe them as not directly prevent, preventing um, uh, um, instances of inappropriate advice because they create an environment um, that helps to lower the risk, so for example, onboarding processes, but they don't necessarily directly prevent instances of inappropriate advice. Mm, but this document tells us that there wasn't enough weighting towards those measures at this time. Yes, and I believe that is reflecting um, that environment that I've just described. And at uh, 4801 of this document, we see again the reference to the controls testing outcome. And this time there are six ineffective controls identified, four of them identified as ineffective and two identified as perceived ineffective. Uh, yes, I see that. And those controls we see from this um, a final row that were ineffective, again, related to the audit process and the pre-vet process and incident management. I'm sorry, do, do you mind if I look at the later context? No, not at all. Yep. Yes, I see that. Yes, and could we just go to the heat map again for this document, which is at 4817. And by this time, the risk of delivery of non-compliant advice has been increased from moderately likely to likely. Yes, I see that. So the risk treatment plan has not reduced the risk, the risk has increased. Yes, that's what it shows. But nonetheless, the Business Risk and Compliance Committee decided to accept that high risk again until the 30th of June 2015 with another risk treatment plan? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. I tender this document, Commissioner. Global Wealth Business Risk and Compliance Committee meeting papers 26 August 2014, ANZ 800 052 4780 is exhibit 2.155. Um, then, on the 1st of July 2015, the same committee, the Business Risk and Compliance Committee, decided to, Compliance Committee, decided to continue to accept the high risk until the 30th of June 2016? Uh, yes, there were additional um, treatment plans that were approved mm -hmm. and um, oversighted and the risk was accepted. Again? Um, the risk treatment plan was accepted. Until the 30th of June 2016. And then there was a meeting of the same committee again <coughs> on the 26th of June 2016. Uh, and could I ask you to look at ANZ 800 053 Again, discussion of acceptance of the risk of delivery of non-compliant advice and breach of ANZ's Australian Financial Services licence. And this time we see from 6573 that the committee is asked to extend the risk acceptance again until the 30th of June 2017. Yes, that's correct. 
Uh, and at 6572, we see that again, deficiencies in the systems for monitoring and oversight of advisors are identified. I'll just wait till these pages come up on the screen. We have that page now. I wanted to direct your attention to a paragraph in the middle of the page, Ms Rickson, which relates to this risk of delivery of non-compliant advice. The key purpose of monitoring and supervision activities governed through ORMMF. What is ORMMF? That's the oper Operational Risk Framework of ANZ. The key purpose is to identify individual and systemic situations where advisers fail to provide quality advice. Many key controls remain reactive with a strong desire through investment outlined below to move to a more preventative control environment to identify emerging risks around quality of advice prior to customers being detrimentally impacted. Improving the effectiveness of current monitoring and supervision activities while investing in the development of preventative measures will be core to reducing residual risk within Wealth Australia's risk appetite. Yes, I see that. So still, uh, in June 2016, ANZ has not fixed the need to wait towards preventative measures rather than detective measures. Uh, and there is still inadequate investment in the development of preventative measures. No, no I, I don't agree with that in the sense that there were, um, uh, there was considerable strengthening in the control environment. Um, that paragraph is making reference to the fact that ANZ had at that time been investing in the development of preventative measures, but that they had not come to fruition yet. Well, let's look further at that, uh, Ms Rickson. Um, I tender this document and I'll then take you to the minutes of the meeting that considered it. Yes. Business Risk and Compliance Committee meeting papers 23 June. 2016, ANZ 800 053 exhibit 2.156. Could I ask you to look at ANZ 800 8401, which is the minutes of the committee meeting held on the 23rd of June 2016. You yes, were, I have that, thank you. You were present at this meeting, Ms Rickson, as yes. the chair? Yes, I was. And we see from 8403 that the committee then, in this meeting, in <coughs> June 2016, again approved the extension of the risk acceptance in relation to non delivery of non-compliant advice and breach of financial services licence obligations extended it to the 30th of June 2017. Yes, I see that. And do you see there um, that the committee noted in the third paragraph down, second sentence, this risk acceptance has been extended four times, acknowledging one of the root causes of the continual delay is the inability to get the appropriate technology in place to enhance the control environment. Yes, I see that. As the chair of this meeting, did it concern you that this was now the fourth time that the committee had been asked to accept that there was a high risk that customers of ANZ would not be provided with quality advice? I was certainly concerned that the um, risk had been extended. Um, 
the risk is not a high likelihood that customers won't be provided with um, high quality ad advice. The risk is the likelihood of consequences, of those consequences occurring, which is um, systemic, um, instances of systemic um, uh, reportable breaches that require reporting and those other things that were that were read out in the um, risk acceptance. And just it's pausing there, it is that risk that was identified as high, that systemic risk. It, and which it's had been it's the, the risk that um, systemic um, instances of systemic financial advice may result in reportable breaches to the regulator, mm -hmm. um, regulators having to intervention by um, investigations by regulators, the consequences that were mentioned in relation to um, financial loss and customer loss. Um, it isn't the probability or likelihood of an instance of inappropriate advice. No, it's the probability or it's likelihood of systemic provision of non-compliant advice and breach of AFSL obligations. It's, it's the probability of um, systemic um, instances that may lead to, a reportable, to reportable breaches. Yes, well, that's a matter of significant concern, isn't it, that your business, ANZ, recognised that that was a high systemic risk and extended the risk under treatment plans that did not reduce the risk over four consecutive years. Yes, it's very regrettable. It did. It has reduced the risk, but the risk has um, has not come down to where we would like it to be. Well, did it concern you at this time when you were chairing this meeting last year that it was taking so long to implement changes that had been identified by this committee as necessary back in 2014? Sorry, I've, I've referred to this as the 2017 meeting, the 2016 meeting. Uh, yes, I was concerned that the technology advancements that we were making were um, not in place now. Of course I was concerned. Why did it take so long to get the technology in place? Well, there was a number of technology um, initiatives that were um, going to help us to um, create a more preventative environment. Um, one of those was advanced data analytics. Um, a, um, a version of that was put in place between 2014 and 2015. Um, and then another vendor was looked at um, around 2015, 16, I believe, but it wasn't until mid-2016 that we found um, a solution that um, we did a proof of concept on that we thought would work. So the reality is in relation to advanced data analytics, it's a very embryonic area for this industry and in fact for operational risk. And so it has taken us um, a long time too, too long, I accept, much longer than we would like it to, to build a system, which we're about to launch the first indicators next month, that will ingest whole systems and be able to give us a much more predictive um, environment. And another um, um, significant technology advancement in the preventative controls is a system called Grow for Advice for ANZ Financial Planner that I refer to my, in my statement. Once again, that we did do a number of searches. We started um, with another vendor in um, late 2013, early 2014 that didn't um, deliver results. And we started to, we decided that we, the only option was to build that um, platform ourselves. We commenced that in mid 2014. It's been a very, very complex um, project that involves uh, over 180 algorithms to provide a um, much more guide rail based preventative way of um, providing um, 
insurance advice and we're scaling that out to superannuation and retirement planning. In relation to other technology initiatives, I've earlier um, referred to the um, more comprehensive use of X-Plan and Advisor Hub. Regrettably, we should have started those earlier. I tender this document, Commissioner. Minutes of the Business Risk and Compliance Committee meeting of 23 June 16, ANZ 800 8401 is Exhibit 2.157. That was June 2016, Ms Rickson. Can I take you to a document from November 2016, which is ANZ 800 1650819? So this is a few months over the, after the last meeting and it's an internal audit update for the aligned dealer groups for the Risk and Compliance Board Committee meeting that was scheduled to take place on the 21st of November 2016. Yes, I see that. You see there at the executive summary that the audit of the aligned dealer groups was self-disclosed adverse with a finalised 3B rating. Could you explain what that means? Uh, the rating of an audit is split into um, the numbered rating, which is um, one to four, I believe at that time, and um, uh, a management awareness rating of A, B and C. So um, a rating three self-disclosed means that management has um, disclosed that um, it has um, some deficiencies um, in its control environment and a rating three means that there are issues um, within, um, within a number of controls in its business that, have, that may have a, um, uh, may relate to a material deficiency in the control and, um, and the management awareness um, rating is a rating a, B or C, which relates to how aware management is of um, the control environment and the, 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 the state of that control environment. So a rating B means that management has an awareness of the, um, uh, of the state of its control environment. We see that the document records that a number of significant issues were identified by management and by internal audit. The adverse rating on the control framework is not a reflection of the levels of effort and engagement by management to date, but is rather an indication of the level of residual risk in the ADG's business, given the increased regulatory expectations across the industry. A quantum shift in investment is required to enable the ADGs, the aligned dealer groups, to meet these expectations manage change to address regulatory reform, deliver on customer remediation programs, improve the control environment and deliver on the long-term strategic objectives of the business. So what I want to put to you is that this shows that even in late 2016, ANZ still hadn't made the required investment to create an adequate control environment um, to ensure that customers received adequate advice? Um, I have recently read this document and I, I, don't, um, I, I, I don't know why that um, says what it says. I, I don't agree that at that point in time there needed to be a quantum shift in investment mm -hmm. and, I, and I, um, I have that view because as I, was dis as I was discussing there was at that time a considerable amount of investment um, that was happening in across various technology initiatives. I accept that they hadn't completed at that time. I don't know exactly what else that might have been referring to. Mm. And this was a paper that went to um, your committee. Uh, no, it. That's not a paper that went to my committee, that went to the Aligned Dealer Group's Risk and Compliance Board I Committee. I see, so a different Risk and Compliance Committee. Yes. Um, I want to put to you that instead of 
making the investment in an effective way to ensure these preventative systems were in place promptly, ANZ uh, continued to accept the high risk that customers would receive non-compliant advice and that there would be breaches of ANZ's financial services licence. No, I don't accept that. As I've said before, there were some um, cases on reflection where um, ANZ could and should have commenced some technology initiatives earlier. Other technology initiatives, um, I don't, my view is I don't really believe we could have started them any earlier because there wasn't um, those kinds of solutions in the market. We can, know. I, can I interrupt and just, the, the premise for your answer is that the only solution is technological. Uh, can you explain to me why uh, that seems to be the premise uh, for the answer? Uh, do you see the problem that I'm trying to explore or do I need to explain it better than I have? I think I understand, Commissioner. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm certainly not saying that technology is the only answer. Um, what I am saying, though, is that many of the controls in the industry today are either controls that are preventative only in the sense of they broadly create an environment, such as making sure that you onboard appropriately qualified people. So they broadly create an environment that lowers, tries to lower the risk, but they don't directly prevent an advisor um, from making a mistake or from doing something, um, some sort of dishonest conduct. Um, my, and so whilst we have an industry and environment where the detective controls we rely on, so those that detect the advice are after the fact, like an audit, and um, only create, uh, only look at a sample um, there will be limitations on how, how um, much you can mitigate the risk or lower the risk. The, what technology gives us um, the opportunity to do is to, um, on the one hand, have more predictive data analytics where we can work out what are the, what's the data or the indicators that can actually tell us um, or give us an indication where an advisor um, might or an, or, an, or an experience might be at risk of a customer receiving inappropriate advice. And for a platform like Grow for Advice, what are the systems we can put, put in place that guide the advisor through the process with the customer in a lot of cases that make it much, much easier for them to get it right and to pick up where they get it wrong very quickly and in many cases before the advice is implemented. And that was what I meant by those statements, Commissioner. Why is that a problem? I'm not saying uh, the answer is one way or the other, but why is that a problem that cannot be addressed by different supervisory, different management, uh, real live human <coughs> beings, uh, supervising and managing what advisors are doing? Uh, I think it can be to an extent, but like I said, it. it and, and you can see we've improved our, um, our requirements for supervision and how we, um, um, what we require of our supervisors. And that certainly, I think, does make a significant difference. Um, but they, you know, there is no one sort of checking everything that goes, every piece of advice that goes out the door. And so while, um, while we have that environment, what we're trying to do is look at all the different ways in which we can lower the risk that a customer receives a bad outcome to as, as low as we possibly can. And I believe that technology is, I don't want to use this kind of language, but it's colloquial, but it's a game changer, if you like. Ms. Orr? We know, don't we, Ms. Rickson, that on the 14th of June last year, the issue of acceptance of this risk for non-compliant advice and breaches of ANZ's financial services licence came back before the committee with you as chair again? Yes, it did. Uh, and the committee was asked to grant another extension, this time until the 30th of June this year? 
Yes, that's correct. And the committee granted that extension until the 30th of June this year, didn't it? Yes, it did. And doesn't the continued need for ANZ to accept a high risk that its customers will be provided with non-compliant advice in a systemic way, as you point out, leading to breaches of your financial services licence, indicate that for many years the systems and processes at ANZ have been inadequate? No, I don't accept that our systems and process have been inadequate in whole. I do accept that there have been um, certain controls that have had um, deficiencies in them over the past um, periods that you are looking at. What, what do you think, Ms Rickson, is an acceptable level of risk that customers will be provided with non-compliant advice? Well, I would like there to be no customers that are um, provided with non-compliant advice. Um, and I, I, I would certainly like it to be very, very low. But it's a human system. Uh, people make mistakes. Uh, people do wrong things. What should be the target? I mean, the target should no doubt be zero. Uh, we should always be trying to get to zero, but we've got to recognise it's a human system. What sort of number uh, should be accepted in the real world rather than the ideal world? That's a very difficult question, Commissioner. It is, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I can. What I can say is that. Um, we do examine these things and turn our mind to them from time to time in a risk management framework. Because as you say, um, it's, all, it, it's impossible to reduce it to zero because humans and technology will make mistakes. But we do look at things like um, what is a tolerance threshold for a reportable event, if you like. So in other words, a reportable um, breach, which is an instance of um, a, of systemic um, financial advice, and we do look at that being something very low, which could be in the order of um, two per six months. Or and then we can also look at things like um, how quickly they're closed, because when things go wrong, how quickly does the organisation then um, address, investigate, address, and remediate that? So there, there's a number of different measures that you can have tolerance thresholds for that's, that is, um, uh, that's looked at from the perspective of historical versus what you might want it to be forward looking. And for the client, the only acceptable outcome is that the advice is uh, sound and proper advice. Do you accept that? Indeed, I do. But from the business point of view, where you are dealing with the overall mass of the business, are you able to put any numerical value? Uh, and it, maybe you can't, but are you able to put any numerical value on what you think a realistically attainable uh, level of, whether you put it acceptable advice or unacceptable advice, mm -hmm. uh, should be in today's circumstances? Well, I think you can look at, as I've said, how many instances that you have that are reportable due to a systemic issue. I think you can look at what are the advisor audit pass rates and what is a, a, a tolerance threshold um, for, for those. I think you could look at how quickly when something goes wrong that you um, remediate that. Find it and fix yep. it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I have no further questions, Commissioner. I need to tender the last document that I referred to, which was That's the, the internal, internal audit, audit update. update uh, line dealer groups, risk and compliance uh, board committee, 21 November 16, ANZ 800 165 0819 is exhibit 2.158. Now, does any party other than ANZ seek leave to cross-examine Ms Rickson? 
No. Ms Williams. Uh, there's nothing arising, Commissioner. Might thank Ms Rickson you. be excused? Yes, Ms Rickson, thank you for uh, giving your evidence. You, are, you may step down and you are excused. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm sorry, just pardon me one moment. Okay. This one? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, before we complete the ANZ uh, case study within that topic, uh, Ms Williams wishes to tender a document, Commissioner, and we have no objection to that. Yes. Yes, I'm grateful to my learned friend. There is one document uh, relating uh, to the recruitment of Mr Doyle, a subject matter dealt with in Mr Ware, it's evidence. I've shown the document to my learned friend. It's uh, ANZ 800 511 1854. I tend to that document. It's a Emails case. between Warner and McKenna, Reed Doyle, 23 April 2013, 22 and 23 April 2013, ANZ 800 511 Exhibit 2.159. Yes. Commissioner, the third and final entity through which we will examine the provision of inappropriate advice is AMP. Uh, would the Commissioner give us a moment to yes, how long reset do you need? the bar table? Just a few if, minutes. If I come back at, what, five past twelve? Or? Thank you, Commissioner. Yes.